welcome to Frequency with Clovistia. I'm your host, Grace Starr, and my co-host is Dr. Katherine Lehman. For reasons I don't fully understand, I have been asked to share channeled information and wisdom from my 12th dimensional star self named Clovistia. I'm not sure where this journey will take us, but as we begin, I ask you to join me. Welcome back, listeners. Today, I want to share with you a past life. Sometimes I remember past lives by doing regression therapy and, uh, you know, past life therapy, but sometimes I remember them organically. Ever since I started remembering my lives way back when I had my near death experience that I've shared with you, I've had these come up at different times. So this is the situation I was finding myself in. During that time frame, I had been finding myself constantly judging my husband's decisions. No matter what he wanted to do, if he wanted to go left or if he wanted to go right, I just felt like he didn't think his choices completely through and that his choices were questionable. I felt like maybe he needed to understand the consequences more before making decisions. It became a problem with us. It began to trail into all aspects of our lives. And even simple things like going to the grocery store was an issue. My constant criticism of him was starting to annoy even myself. I began to realize we had a big problem on our hands, and I didn't know where it was coming from. I just didn't trust him. Could this be related to a past life? I realized that I needed to begin to open my mind to the idea that it could, in fact, be related to something in the past. But where would that path lead me? Very good question that I didn't know the answer to before we started. And I wondered what new challenges would encroach into my marriage if I had the memories. But I always believe that the past is shown to you for reasons. One evening when I was driving by myself alone at night, a memory drifted into my mind of another place and time. And as much as I tried to shove it out of my mind, it did not want to go away. As the images started coming into my mind, gradually they became more and more clear, like the focus on a camera lens. There was an oasis in the middle of nowhere with date palms, running water, grass, and the area was very, very large. I didn't recognize it as myself. So I thought this is not a current life memory. I found myself standing on the edge of what seemed like an oasis to me. It's the only way that I could describe it. But it was dark and I couldn't see that well. But the awareness was starting to come to me. I stood looking out into the darkness with my arms folded behind my back. And an old bent over man was approaching. He was admonishing me to come back away from the desert night. That it was too dangerous to be near the desert in the darkness. His thoughts began to join with my awareness and his mind and my mind began to share information and I realized I was becoming more connected. I tried to be careful and tried to separate my actual self from the memory. I had already remembered a few traumatic lives and I know you've listened to them and I knew that I needed a protective barrier. I tried to imagine this memory on a screen, and I was simply watching it, but I was slipping into the physical life, and his thoughts and memories were becoming more of a part of me. The old bent-over man who had approached gently touched my shoulder to guide me. Angrily, I thought, how dare he touch my body? He had no right. He's a mere servant. I could have him killed if I wanted. I stopped to think who I possibly could be after that statement. Who was this kid? 
This was a much different life than child of God, which I shared previously. In that life, I was a street orphan, penniless, filthy. But in this life, I was apparently someone, and this boy knew it. He did not want to go back away from the darkness. And as I turned around, I became aware that there was a great gathering going on in the distance. A huge tent towered over the date palms, and it was surrounded by many dozens of horses and camels. I could hear music playing inside, and the scent of roasting meat drifted into my senses. The old man was insistent that I go inside, and reluctantly I walked ahead of him as we wove our way through the crowd of waiting animals towards the tent entrance. As we entered, the old man fell back into the crowd, but I walked forward as if I owned the place and took my place beside my father who was sitting on the throne. I looked at him and realized that my father was the sheik. He was the master of all of this domain. There were so many wives, more wives than a person could count, and children, lots of children. I was a male child, about 11 years old. Male children were raised by men. Female children were raised by women. Memories flooded in my mind, and I became aware that the older, bent-over man that had approached me had done that many times with many warnings. His voice was ringing in my head. You know you're not supposed to go out here by yourself. I have told you 1,000 times, it is a risk to you and to everyone. If something happens to you, heed my warning, Nashu. I realized that was my name. My name was Nashu. As my eyes adjusted to the light in the tent, I looked down at my clothing and realized that, in fact, I was standing in a beautiful white caftan made of the finest fabric. I looked over at the old man that was keenly watching me. I was dressed impeccably. My hair was perfectly combed. I was handling myself perfectly. I had cared less about what this man was telling me so many times, which was very wrong, because he had raised me from the time that I was young. As soon as I came off my mother, As a man-child, I was taken to live with the men, and this man took care of me. I was about two or three years old when that happened, and I had been with him since that period of time. My father was busy conducting business, and so this man took care of me. All the women of the harem are like mothers to me. I love all of them as a son to a mother. I knew each and every one of them and I was loved by all. They were all mother to me. But my mother was the one who was the most special who had my heart. I thought of these things as I stood beside my father. I looked up into the top of the grand tent. It was a very large tent that could hold a hundred people or more. It is where my father conducted business. I was Nubian. I was very black. I was treasured above everyone else. There were many groups of men all asking for the sheik to administer the law to maintain control of the land. Some of the men were angry with his decisions. They objected to the results. They wanted change. But my father was firm. He had thought about it. He felt his decision was just and fair for all. He ruled that his decision would stand. One group of the men were angry, and when they left, I didn't really care. They were bringing in the food and the dancers. The music was beginning to become louder, and people were walking around chatting in small groups. The grand table with all the food was prepared, and it was my focus. I was hungry. I was always curious about which delicacies would be served each night. I always eagerly awaited the arrival of the special food from exotic places. 
the finest chef in the land prepared all of the meals for my father during these times. I ate until I could eat no more, and the evening seemed to wear on and on for hours. I was tired. I knew that I should go to bed, but I just wasn't ready to do that. I decided to walk to the edge of the oasis one last time. It was a full moon, and the oasis was lit up in the dark shadows. It was easy to see as I threaded my way between camels on my way to the edge of the greenery and the beginning of the darkness of the desert. It was calling to me. It pulled me further into the darkness. The silence in the desert felt so stark. There didn't seem to be a sound of anything. But suddenly, in the distance, I could barely hear hoofbeats. There was more than one, perhaps a group. As they drew closer, I strained my eyes to see, but there were only shadows. Was there an emergency? What was happening? And I leaned forward into the darkness. Suddenly, crash! I was knocked to the ground. It hurt, and I was in pain. I thought, who dare touch me like that? Then they grabbed me, and they threw me inside a burlap bag. I crumpled all up into a ball of limbs. I was roughly thrown over the side of a horse, and we were running into the night, into the desert darkness. My body banged harshly on the horse's side. I found it hard to breathe, and my chest heaved. There was so little air in the bag, it seemed. We rode further and further. I partially lost consciousness or fell asleep. I'm not sure which one it was, but I drifted, banging and banging against the horse, and I was less aware of it. My limbs were aching. As dawn broke the horizon, I could barely see light through the woven bag. The horse stopped its sides heaving roughly up and down. A few men grabbed the bag, and I was dumped onto the ground. My shoulder and back ached. I had never been treated this way. I was dragged inside of a cave, and a door was slammed, and the men just left me sitting there in this dirty, smelly place. I sat there stunned in silence. But gradually, I pulled back the burlap and fresh air gushed into the bag. I took a deep breath and another and another. I laid there on the dirt floor alone. My beautiful white outfit was covered in dirt and blood, which I realized was my own. I thought, someone will pay for this. I shouted this in my mind. I began to think of the old bent man. What would happen to him when I was discovered missing? Would he be safe? He had sworn his life to protecting me from the time I came into his custody to be raised. It was I who had made the bad decision to go out late at night, but I realized that he would be the one who would pay. I crawled out of the bag and went to sit in the corner of the tiny room and became aware that it was dirty, and spider-filled. I hate spiders. It was no bigger than a large storage hole. It was silent through the day, and as darkness began to set, a peasant girl brought me a stale piece of bread and some water. She kept her eyes downcast, and she didn't speak my language. I began to think of ways to escape. It was a long night for me to think of opportunities. But I was naive and did not know any good ideas. I did think of myself as a resourceful, smart young man. But I had no ideas. I had never been or seen this situation before. In the morning light, I got up enough courage to crawl over to the door to test it. And I realized it was not locked. This was my opportunity. I slowly opened the door enough to put my head out. As I did, I looked over my left shoulder. In the distance, I could see a massive construction project going on. But as myself, I screamed, those are pyramids. 
They are building pyramids. Oh my gosh. Suddenly the door slammed on my head and I crashed back into the cave. I hurt everywhere. I had never felt such pain in my life. I seemed to hurt everywhere. My head was racked in pain. And I realized blood was trickling down the side of my face and I felt it with my hand. My blood looked so different than other blood I had seen and I'm not sure why. Roughly the door opened and a man with no shirt and loose-fitting striped pants stood over me with a massive curved blade with a big wooden handle. It was nearly as tall as me. If you try to escape again, you will be killed and your body will be returned to your father on a stick. Terror shook my small body and feelings that I had never felt before assaulted my mind. I crept into a small dark corner and tried to be as tiny as I possibly could be. I hoped that they would forget about me completely. I waited. It became dark. There was no light that seeped into the cave at all. The sound of night creatures could not be heard. I was alone. I was absolutely alone for the first time in my life. I felt very small. Oh, why hadn't I listened to the advice and stayed with the old bent man? I thought of all the people back at the oasis. They were going to be missing me. All the women, all the children, the food, the camels, my favorite horse, my bed. Oh, I suddenly wanted to be in my soft and secure bed. I thought, I am a chosen son. I am destined to lead my people just as my father. I stood up, put my hands on my hip, and stuck my chest out. They would not break me. I tried to muster my greatest strength. But after a few moments of silence, I sat back down. Fear swept over me. What if I never saw any of them again? What would happen? As the night dragged on and the hours became tiny, I began to lose hope. They would never find me. I wasn't even sure where I was. I wonder what those strange things in the distance that they were constructing, what are they? What were they for? What are they called? They were huge. The movement around them looked like tiny ants. Suddenly, there was a crash on the door. I looked up to see a wall of men come bursting into the room, crashing through the door, tumbling in a pile. In the midst of that pile was my father. He had come to save me. He came to me, lifting me in his arms and holding me so tight I thought I would break. The men immediately began talking about an escape plan and how to get us out of the hills safely. The men had just gotten to their feet and started to make a decision when the door opened and more men came rushing into the room. They were the bad men. They had their swords drawn. A great battle ensued, and the sound of swords crashing and clanking together filled the room. Then the sounds of swords stabbing people to death began to fill the room, and then blood began to fill the room. There was blood flying all over the small room. I looked down on my beautiful clothing that was filthy dirty to see it was now covered with more blood. My father was a champion. He was fighting men off left and right, blade flying, glistening in the moonlight. But my father's men were falling one by one. Men that I knew and loved were dying for me right before my eyes. My father and his men were losing. They were outnumbered. More bad men pushed into the room. I thought for a moment of the women, children, and others that were back at the oasis. This would be devastating. This is a life-changing tragedy. My father was their absolute protector. They would all be sold into slavery or murdered or worse. I became very angry as I watched the battle rage on. I admit that it was selfish. I thought of my mother. I thought of the atrocities that would befall her. I thought of all my other mothers in the harem 
it was unthinkable. My brain hurt. My brothers, my sisters, all the men would be murdered or sold into slavery. All the women would be taken away. They would go to different parts of the world to be sold at will. The sheer raw fear of this vulnerability caused my blood to run cold. I became aware that they were down to the last man, and it was my father. All of his men lay bleeding to death. He stood there with sword raised, but it was hopeless. More men rushed into the room and attacked him, stabbing him over and over. He was cut to shreds. They wanted to make sure that he was dead. He bled to death in front of my eyes. I remained cowering in the corner, in the shadows. No one noticed me. They all began congratulating themselves. They had killed the great Amar. They joyously patted each other on the back as they left the cave. And then it was over. The door remained open and I could see my father lying on the floor in a pool of blood just outside the door. I went to him. I stood over him. I shouted at him. What were you thinking? What about everyone back at the oasis? Where is their protection? It was not worth it. I was not worth losing everything and everyone. I hate you. I hate you. I wept for my mother. I went back to my corner and I stayed awake the rest of the night. I wondered what would happen in the morning. When the first rays of morning light began to stream into the cave, a man came back and began to drag the bodies out of the cave. I remained in the corner, but my protective shadow was gone. When he was near the end of his job, he noticed me. He stopped and he stood staring at me as if I was a wild animal that would run away. Slowly he backed out of the cave and stood in the doorway. He shouted for somebody that I could not see. Moments later, the main bad man pushed past him into the cave. He stared at me as if he wanted to tear me to pieces by himself. He ordered the men to bring me outside. They harshly grabbed my arm and drug me through the dirt, out the door, and threw me into the middle of a small courtyard. I stood up and looked past them to see the pyramids again, for a, just a glimpse. I was surrounded by men very quickly. The cruel looks on their faces frightened me. I knew that nothing good was going to happen here. I saw them taking out their swords, and I was the center of their attention. The first sword attack came from the back. It felt like a simple poke, and then another, and another, and then there were dozens of sword pokes. It didn't hurt nearly as badly as I was expecting. I began to drift almost immediately, bleeding to death right away, drifting out of my body and out towards the light down the tunnel towards heaven. This was my last memory of that life, and there was nothing after this but darkness. Once I was safely back in my body and I shook off the awareness of this past life. I was so angry at my father. He should have thought about the decision more. His choice was not the right choice. And there it was. All the questioning and pent up anger towards my husband was released like a waterfall crashing down. All the anger, all the emotions, all the lost love and people this was a life-changing moment for me. I sat sobbing because I realized that my father in that life was my current husband. I recognized him at the very end when he was fighting in the cave so hard for me, trying to save me. All of my problems with him dissolved on that night, and I no longer questioned him about everything. I realized that he loved me so much he was willing to risk and give his own life and everything to save me. So profound. The outcome in that life is not what either of us wanted, 
but I was able to release all the anger and pain from so long ago so I could live my current life here and now. It was a new beginning that opened the way for a long and joyous marriage. And I am so thankful that I was able to have the memory of this past life of Nashu. Thank you to all of our listeners. If you have enjoyed our frequency journey today, please share it with your family and friends. Make sure to visit us at clovistia.com or you can follow us on Instagram and Facebook where we have about a million followers over there. Until next time, please share your frequency.